Hello, everyone. If you are new to our webinar series, Criterion Edge does multiple webinars every year. I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us today for this webinar. Our topic today is hidden traps that will derail your CER. Answer these critical questions before you start writing. If you've joined us previously, you may have enjoyed our two comprehensive webinars uh, on how you can assess your CERs for MDR readiness. All of our webinars can be found on our website to view on demand. So I want to encourage everybody to go online, check under our resources page to watch those webinars and uh, get the slides as well as you need. Um, so let's get started. Our speaker today is Criterion Edge's president and founder, Lori Mitchell. Um, Lori is the founder and president of Criterion Edge, a global medical and regulatory writing and safety services firm serving the medical device, pharmaceutical, and biotech industries. Lori has over 20 years of experience in medical writing, safety, and pharmacovigilance management, and regulatory reporting. Having provided regulatory and medical writing solutions to, to many pharma and medical device companies, both large and small, She's a proven leader in designing practical strategies to meet current global regulatory challenges. Lori is a published author and holds a Master of Nursing from UCLA. Hey, wonderful. So our first question, is there a minimum number of databases that you have to search for literature review? Um, as I had said, Embase and Medline are recommended as the two different databases to search, both of them. In other words, the recommendation is Embase and Medline, not Embase or Medline. Um, but certainly, uh, if there is another particular um, database that might be very relevant to your content, uh, Talks File is one that we're doing for our IVD customers um, and others. Uh, you know, access those as well. But there is, there is not a minimum number per se, I believe, called out in the MDR, certainly, but MedDevRev4 recommends uh, Embase and Medline. Thanks, Lori. The next question is, do we need to provide PMS data if it is a new MDR certification and there's no data available for the device gathered under MDR? or should we include PMS data, which was gathered before MDR certification? So I always give this caveat, and I'll give it now, is that we at Criterion Edge are not regulatory affairs professionals or strategists per se. And I always couch when we get questions like this, that it's important to talk to your regulatory affairs people internally to, um, when you have you know, questions that you may wonder about from a regulatory standpoint, but this is really from a standpoint of the MDR. So if it's a new MDR certification, so I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, assume that this is a, a revision of MDD to MDR, thus there has, the, the device has been on the market and thus there has already been PMS post-market data uh, collected. And if you are revving an, uh, a device that's been on the market from an MDD to an MDR clinical evaluation, then it would be relevant to put your uh, any available uh, PMS data gathered under a certain time range. Remember, all data, all of the clinical data sources within a CER have a time range. It's not you don't have to be exhaustive. You don't need to go back 25 years or even 10 years. Usually five years is kind of a sweet spot. So you would pull up five years of PMS data, even if it is gathered under um, MDD circumstances, it's still data and it's data on that same exact device. So, so MDR, MDD is not relevant in that case because the data will be analyzed now under MDR rules against safety and performance objectives, GSPRs, acceptance criteria. So uh, you should include PMS data that was gathered before MDR certification, yes. Okay, uh, thank you, Lori. Next question. If we find that we do not have what you would consider sufficient clinical evidence, but have a well-developed PMCF plan for how to fill those gaps, have the notified bodies been willing to accept that? 
So in our experience, again, our clients are the our clients are the ones that have those direct interactions with the notified body. We certainly, um, you know, benefit from long relationships with our clients in which we are now helping them craft uh, the responses to those questions. So we do see notified body uh, questions and uh, help the our our clients craft the responses to those. So I want to be. There's a lot packed into this question. So a well-developed PMCF plan to fill those gaps. Well, of course, a plan does not, con uh, does not contain data. So while a PMCF plan is important to present in an MDR, it will not mitigate a lack of, it cannot mitigate because it doesn't have any data in it. Um, it cannot mitigate insufficient clinical evidence. And um, what is what is sufficient clinical evidence? I mean, I think everybody wishes they, there was a hard and fast answer to that question, and there isn't. But um, have the notified bodies been willing to accept a well-developed PMCF plan to help mitigate perhaps insufficient clinical evidence? Not in my experience, because a PMCF plan does not have data in it. Therefore, it would not help with the sufficiency of clinical evidence. Okay. The next question, um, it is, if our device is new on the market, do we have to provide literature search um, or on similar devices, for example? So if your device is new on the market, there you would, it would be best practice to provide a, a literature search because you may have, um, some, you may have some data out there that will be a part of some of your clinical investigation data or data that is uh, already maybe underway or for studies that are underway. So you should go through that step uh, to show them, to demonstrate to the notified body that you have indeed looked and indeed there is nothing or there is just this one article that sort of thing. It's a step that shouldn't be assumed to be overlooked. Um, the notified body would certainly um, understand that there's that there's no uh, clinical data out in the published realm on your particular device. Now, this is specifically talking about the subject device, not the competitor devices that will be used to help establish the acceptance criteria for safety and performance. So. So that's a different story. Those are competitor devices, but for your own subject device, yes, you should run that search, but be careful. If you are conducting internal clinical investigations and you have those data, that's manufacturer hill on uh, clinical investigations being done on your device, don't duplicate uh, those data by also pulling an article, which present a published article, which presents the same data. So you have to be careful about that. All right. Uh, the next question is, what happens if you fail an audit of your systematic literature review? Uh, well, I, I imagine you're having a pretty bad day if, if, that, if that happens. Um, so if your notified body comes in and begins to shoot holes in your systematic literature review, which Means, means to say basically your methodology, how you went about it. Uh, they will simply ask you, uh, in our experience, again, because uh, we have engaged with clients, uh, which that's exactly what's happened, is that they question, in other words, question your systematic literature review data because they question the methodology at the end of the day. Uh, they usually, I would have, in our experience, would give you the opportunity to correct that. And but you would correct it by conducting a proper systematic literature review over this, the same time range that you would have previously already established in the CER. And you know, for lack of a better way of saying it, do it properly. And then thus then present those data in the CER and basically sort of rewrite your CER because now you're going to have maybe you're going to have additional data and that's going to have to be woven into every analysis and table and everything else. But it's, it, res it, rescue you, it rescues the CER from 
um, a worse fate, which is out and out rejection. Okay. Next question is, is equivalence mandatory if there is not a direct comparative device? So we've got kind of two words in there that I wanna be really clear about. So let's talk first about equivalence. Equivalence is, equivalence comes into play in a CER when the CER presents more than one subject device. Let's just say a family of cardiac stents uh, that are very, very, um, very, very similar to each other. Um, <clears throat> that's where equivalence must now be established amongst the family of subject devices that are under evaluation in the CER. Those, so those are not, those are not really comparative. You're not compare, you're, you sort of compare them because you establish equivalence. But then once equivalence, a gap analysis is presented on each clinical, technical, and biological aspect of each of those, say, three stints, and you address a gap analysis of each characteristic that is similar, not the same, but similar, and you must now establish and justify that, that the difference, in other words, that, that they're similar but not exactly the same, those differences have no clinical impact on the patient. So that's equivalence. So, so if there is, so you do not need to um, establish equivalence, obviously, if there's only one device in, a, uh, uh, in the CER. If you want to group like devices of your own, your own manufacturer held devices, and you want to group those within a CER, then you must, by definition, establish rock solid equivalence between all of them. If you don't think you can, because you can't justify the gaps of clinical, technical, biological, the similarities, not the same, then you had better rethink how you're grouping your devices. Okay, next question. Where would you put the state-of-the-art analysis in this process? Do you believe this is needed before finalizing CEP? What a great question. Um, we have many clients. Uh, we have one client in particular uh, that takes uh, the approach <clears throat> of including a fully developed state-of-the-art section that's with data, that's on the competitor devices, that's with the safety and performance objectives and the acceptance criteria and the clinical literature search on the competitor devices. That's a full state-of-the-art section. We have one client that uh, likes to do it that way. In our experience, uh, none of our, the rest of our clients um, do it like that. And in the CEP, it is just simply a description or a plan of how to approach the state-of-the-art not the actual data itself on the competitor devices. Um, so, and those, those clients and those CERs have been well accepted by the notified body. So it feels to me, again, without, you know, from our experience, it feels to me that this seems to be an internal uh, preference. Uh, do you write, do you fully write the state of the art section, including the competitor literature search and the acceptance criteria and build those tables um, for the CEP? Or do you simply describe that in the CEP and then do the full job in the CER? Seems to be dealer's choice to us and we're happy to do it either way. All right, thanks Lori. Next question, um, what time frame should you use for the state of the art section? The last two years, five years, et cetera. And I should add that somebody else just asked uh, if you wouldn't mind defining state of the art for the CER. Defining it, did you say? Yeah, someone just asked if you wouldn't mind defining the state of the art for the CER. I wanted to pull it together with this question okay. um, that you're seeing okay. on the screen, if you wanna talk about both of those. Sure, so this, just as a real quick overview, the state of the art section, is the, 
section of the CER, which we usually always present towards the beginning, really kind of right after the executive summary, uh, sometimes after the device description, but usually by section three or four at the most, we are talking about the state of the art. And the state of the art, simply put, is a description of the landscape in which your particular device exists, the therapeutic landscape in which your particular device exists. And the state of the art section, think of it as a freestanding story. It's a story that begins with, in the beginning, there was cardiac heart disease. And the, it, if cardiac heart disease affects X many people, epidemiology, description of the disease state itself, the different um, types of cardiac disease. So in other words, you're kind of talking about the problem, the clinical condition is what it's commonly called. And that can be, and that needs to be covered for every clinical condition and therapeutic area for which your device is approved for use, intended use. So let me take the example of say a pacemaker, uh, 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 like an internal defibrillator. Let's take that for example. So that particular internal cardiac defibrillator has been approved for use to defibrillate or mitigate uh, paroxysmal SVT, SVT, rapid AFib, VFib, VTAC. I just named five things. That are, those are five clinical conditions that you have to describe fully in just the first section of the state of the art because they relate to your device, for example. And then as you move down through the state of the art, you begin to pivot away from describing the clinical condition and the problem, if you will, how prevalent it is, thus the epidemiology. You move into, okay, what do you do about it and how is it treated? So in the case, if we can go with, you know, what I just talked about with SVT and, and uh, VFib and things like that, you would have to go through, basically that falls into two buckets, pharmacological uh, uh, treatments uh, and then non-pharmacological treatments. And in some cases, even a watch and wait, you would do nothing. And you describe all of those, but now of course your device is not pharmacological, it is, a device related treatment. And now you're beginning to fine tune your uh, story. And then you pivot away from that uh, treatment options and you pivot down further and say, well, speaking of uh, implantable cardiac defibrillators as a treatment option, we're gonna talk more about that now because that's where our device lands. And then you talk very specifically about the technology in which exists in implantable cardiac defibrillators. And it may be two or three different types of technology of which yours is one. And now you've, you've narrowed it all the way down to, and here is where our device lands. It uses this type of technology. It does these things. And see, so think of the state of the art as a long story um, that funnels down into now finally arriving at where your device exists in that treatment milieu. Now your device, unless it's very unique, has competitors that treat the same indications in rough, using roughly the same technology. So those competitors now are what you're going to, where you're going to look at those competitor devices and you're gonna draw, do a competitor device search. Now we're talking about what time frame should you use for the state of the art. There, in our experience, there are two uh, literature searches for the state of the art. One is, let's say, non-methodologically robust. It is the state of the art search that you do to help tell that story, looking for guidelines, looking for references, professional, um, you know, uh, um, uh, information off of professional web uh, websites. That time frame uh, can be, uh, uh, you can cast as wide of a net as you want because that just helps you tell the story that does not contain data. So it is not methodologically reviewed in the same way that competitor or subject device searches are done. So that can be any, that type of telling the story of the state of the art, whatever you like. But in our experience, 
the competitor device, right, when you're going to now do a second search for the state of the art, because the competitor device acceptance criteria uh, for GSPRs is usually, again, in our experience, built into the state of the art section, because you're finishing by saying, and look, here, here we are, and are these competitors by this company named this name and this name and this name and this name, these, these are very similar to our device. We're gonna now go to their data and see how well they perform using the same safety and performance objectives selected for our device. We're gonna pull those acceptance criteria, those acceptance ranges and present them there. That is a competitor device search. That's commonly five years. It can be shorter, but probably not by much, maybe three. Probably you don't want it longer because you're gonna have an awful lot to review possibly. So five years is very common, I would say that. Long answer to a short question. <laughs> Thank you, Lori. A very good answer, I think. Um, next question. What if your device is a very simple, well-established technology device? No one is writing articles about it and doing studies. How can we approach the systematic literature review and CER? This is a very common refrain. Nobody, I'll, again, I'm going to use a cardiac uh, um, example. Um, let's talk about a, a guide wire, a cardiac guide wire that's used as part of a procedure. Literally, no one writes about how well did the cardiac guide wire perform? How, what did it do? How, what is it like? You know, what are the outcomes of it? It's very difficult, if not impossible to find that kind of data. And so this is, it's very simple. Cardiac guide wire is very simple and well-established. Okay. So one way to approach that is to extrapolate that if your device is part of a procedure, then um, in which there are many articles written uh, that would include that procedure and thus your guide wire, um, you can extrapolate procedural success, which is reported in these, art in these uh, published journals. Is it was, it was the procedure overall successful? And you can extrapolate logically from that that thus a, a tool in the procedure thus performed as intended. And that is one approach that you can take logically that is acceptable to the notified body. We take that approach commonly in this kind of um, scenario. Now, if your device is not part of a procedure, you may need to get, uh, you know, expand your thinking a little bit, but I think you might, I hope that you get the idea. It's like, then take it one step further. Um, maybe no one's writing about your device, but are they writing about the procedure uh, that your device is um, assists with? Okay, thanks, Lori. We have a, a few more minutes, so I'm going to try to squeeze in a couple more questions for you. Uh, the next question is, is a CDP uh, an MDR requirement? It is mentioned a couple of times in the MDR, but with little direction from the MDR. That's an excellent question and a very topical and timely one. Um, even six months ago, uh, we, we've been writing MDR CERs, you know, for now, golly, I think two, this is our third year. Um, we, we are lucky enough to work with one very large manufacturer who was very early into the MDR world. And we began to um, block out MDR CERs as, as, uh, in 2019. Um, but the CDP was never even a part of that. The clinical development plan, for those of you who may not know what that is, clinical development plan, that's an internal, really an internal document of the manufacturer describing the clinical development plan of the device or devices or family of device, what devices, whatever it is. But it's really just been in the last, I'd say six months or so that the CDP is, is becoming expected an expected input, I would say, into the CER, six, nine months at the most. So in other words, is the CDP um, a, an MDR requirement for the CER? 
reference to the CDP is, it seems to be, they, it seems to be on their radar screen. Let me put it that way. So now we are writing CERs that reference the C, heavily reference the CDP and uh, borrow from that. But that CDP then exists as a freestanding internal uh, revved document within your own organization. Okay, thanks, Lori. Uh, the next question, um, how many comparator devices would you mm. include in the robust state-of-the-art search? So in the competitor devices, I tend to call them competitor devices. Um, you know, so th the question is getting back to those competitor device search, the competitor device search. Now, not the big, broad, state-of-the-art, let's tell the story search, but the very specific competitor device search. So if you're Guidewire X, uh, made by a certain company, and very similar guidewise, Guidewires out there are made by companies A, B, and C, you would include... Um, uh, as, so let's take the guide wires are a good example because there are many. So do you have, to, does it need to be an exhaustive list? Like, oh my God, there are 10, there are 20, you know, guide wires that are just like ours. We tend to advise and work with companies that really just give us like the top competitors. If there's, if the number of competitors are very large, you know, just pick the ones that have the biggest sales that, you know, that are really used a lot thus are going to show up in clinical literature. So um, three, four, five, if there, are that, if there are many to choose from, and less if you don't have as many competitor devices to choose from. All right, and uh, I think I'll put in one more. We have a, just one minute left. Uh, do you prefer clients to sign off at CEP before starting on the CER? Um, we prefer to start the CEP before the CER, most definitely. Um, and that, but when we're engaged with clients and they ask us to write an MDR compliant CER, CEP, SSCP, PMS, PMCF plans, a kind of that whole package, um, we don't wait. These are certainly not done uh, sequentially. These are done concurrently. And the CEP is ultimately signed off usually before the CER at uh, like say a month before the CER is due just so that we have that finality of the CEP if we need to tweak things in the CER but in our experience and how we work with our clients we are tackling both of those documents at the same time and um, lining them up as we go along now understanding that the CEP is uh, is an input essentially into the CER, and there, and we may need to do some, you know, tweaks once the CEP is finalized, but but not wait on the CER before uh, until the CEP is completed. Heavens no, not unless we wanted to make this a eight month long process. But CERs themselves, we like four months on them uh, at least to write them. Well, thank you, Lori. Uh, we are out of time, uh, but thank you so much for taking all those questions. I know there are a couple that we didn't get to, so we'll definitely be reaching out to you guys uh, after the webinar and making sure we can answer your questions and get you your uh, free consult for joining us today. Um, you can email us with more questions or if you want to avail a consult for yourself right now at consult at criterionedge.com. Uh, if you uh, missed our previous webinars on how to assess your, your for MDR readiness, uh, those are available on our website, uh, the recording and the slides as well. And we'll be sending out uh, today's recording and slides uh, to you in an email as well. So thank you so much for attending. And when you do sign off, you'll uh, be prompted to fill out a very short two question survey for us to give us feedback on what you thought of this webinar and how helpful it was for you. So please do take uh, just a couple of seconds to give us your feedback. Uh, I wanna thank everyone again for joining us. Thank you, Lori, so much for this amazing presentation. Uh, thanks everybody, take care, have a wonderful day.